Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of the Japanese Studies and Anti-Racist Pedagogy Project Series. My name is Sophie Hasuo, and I am a second year master's student in the International and Regional Studies Program, and I am a co-coordinator of this project, along with Rachel Willis, Harrison Watson, and Professor Reginald Jackson. Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to briefly explain the format of this event. Um, your microphones and cameras have been disabled. We invite you to submit questions during the lecture through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And our moderator will try to get through as many of them as possible after Dr. Shin's presentation. I also have a few announcements. Next Thursday at noon, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Takashi Fujitani, who will give a talk entitled, Challenges and Opportunities for a Historian of Japanese Teaching a uh, historian of Japan teaching about race and imperialism. The following week on Wednesday, May 5th, we will welcome Dr. Andrea Mendoza, who will present on confronting the ends of area on Trans-Pacific accountability. We are also pleased to announce that the application to participate in our graduate student workshop on June 18th will go live tomorrow at noon and will close on Friday, May 21st. More information about the workshop as well as the application can be found on the JSAP website. The Japanese Studies Anti-Racist Pedagogy Project, which centers BIPOC graduate students and faculty as key partners and co-organizers of this intellectual enterprise, is designed to develop a forum for discussing and promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion within the field of Japanese studies. The project aim is to enhance awareness and quality of teaching related to DEI issues within Japanese studies, with an explicit emphasis on anti-racist pedagogy as the basis for public-facing humanities research and professional development for graduate students. Our products are tools for enacting anti-racist pedagogy at multiple levels through podcast interviews, digitized learning resources, and anti-racist syllabi. In doing so, we can begin to apply a decolonizing approach to educational practices and spaces in our field and in the academy at large to help redress pervasive ideological and methodological biases and help students and scholars from underrepresented backgrounds succeed. This process can foster not just the production of new humanistic knowledge, but also supportive affiliations where joy and mutual thriving infuse our critical and creative work. It's therefore my honor to welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Hua Ji Shin, this year's Center for Japanese Studies Toyota Visiting Professor. Dr. Shin is an Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of San Francisco. She holds degrees from Kansai Gaida University and the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. She earned her PhD in Sociology from SUNY Stony Brook, where she received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching. Dr. Shin is a Zainichi Korean born and raised in Japan. Her research focuses on political sociology with an emphasis on social movements, race and ethnicity, intergroup conflicts, categorical and spatial inequality, colonization, and the history, theory, and sociology of migration, citizenship, and nationalism. Her published work includes articles on the influence of globalization on social movements among Korean minority groups in Japan. Dr. Shin is currently writing a book about Japan's history of making nationhood, migration, and citizenship. As our Toyota visiting professor, Dr. Shin taught a class last fall titled Race, Ethnicity, and Nationhood in Modern Japan. As a student of her class, I learned a great deal as she helped advance my own research and thinking about these topics. And I am personally so excited to listen to her scholarly insight again. So everyone, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Hua Ji Shin, whose talk is entitled Decolonizing Race and Ethnicity, uh, Understanding Racial Formation in Japanese Society. Thank you so much um, for a uh, kind introduction, Sophie. And let me now share my screen so that um, everybody can see my slide. Give me a one second and um, I hope you can see my slide. Okay, okay great. Um, so thank you so much everyone for coming to my webinar today. And 
I'm really excited to be here. And I, it has been a great honor and pleasure to be a Toyota Visiting Fellow, uh, Professor at the CJS during this academic year, despite all the pandemic induced challenge. And I also wanted to express my sincere gratitude to the director, Dr. Reggie Jackson, and his student assistant, Sophie, Rachel, and Harrison, as well as the CJF staff who have supported this anti-racist pedagogy initiative. And I'm very humbled and honored to be a part of this uh, project. And I'm very excited to give a talk, this webinar to explore how we could discuss the concept of race and ethnicity in the classroom and beyond. And, and today I wanna to talk about some of the popular sociological approaches to, the, to conceptualize race and ethnicity. And then I want to talk about how these approaches are maybe useful or not so useful for us to understand and discuss race and ethnicity in the context of Japanese society. This, these are the questions that I wanted to address today. And one of them is, are race and ethnicity real? And can one of those popular DNA testing, can, tell, can they tell you about your race and ethnicity? And is race different from ethnicity? Or should, should it be, right? And uh, according to the American Sociological Association, race is defined as category refers to the physical differences. And whereas ethnicity refers to the shared culture, like such as a language, ancestor, religion, and belief, and you know, the various practices. And I think these definitions are commonly used in the context of the United States. And, but should we treat the race and ethnicity differently? And then if so, under what circumstance we need to do that? Or do we always have to treat the race and ethnicity differently? And then third question I wanna address is, can we talk about the racism among the people who share cultural physical traits together? And in other words, can we talk about the racism, for example, um, between Korean, Japanese, and Chinese? And then the last question I wanna address is, probably this is a million dollar question, is diversity a reason for intergroup conflict? Conversely, can the lack of diversity be a source of for intergroup harmony or orderly society? These questions may seem obvious to some of you. If you grown up and living in a country like the United States for a long time, you'd think you already know quite a bit about race and ethnicity. There's no day goes by um, where you could not hear <laughs> the news that is related to race and ethnicity in America. And I suddenly encounter this type of, I already know this enough kind of attitude about the race and ethnicity among my students in the classroom, as well as my colleague at a workplace. But I would like to challenge um, this pre-existing understanding about race and ethnicity. And I really don't think we have a strong consensus to these questions among ourselves, not as much as we like to think there is. So to answer this question, I wanted to introduce some theoretical approach that are commonly used in sociology and unpack the meaning and in impact of these, uh, these concepts. And then I wanted to explore whether any of those approaches that a social scientists, particularly sociologists use are usable, usable or useful for us to understand and discuss race and ethnicity in the context of Japanese studies and in uh, Japanese society. First theoretical approach that I wanted to discuss is a primordialism. While this approach is no longer very popular in the social science, I still like to introduce this to my students and as well you know, in my class because this way of thinking is still very popular and pervasive in our world today. And white supremacists usually utilize this idea to justify their worldview and treatment of others. And basic premise of primordialism is that race and ethnicity have a stable, unchanging, natural essence, trait, or quality, if you will. And as such, race and ethnicity are a natural category that instruct us to behave differently toward people who share the similar trait as you do or who don't. Underlining tendency in this approach is essentialism. 
this approach essentializes race and ethnicity. I put these examples out here in the slide to show you that how pervasive primordial thinking is. It is not just the conservative white supremacist folks who take this approach, liberal democratic Senate, um, Elizabeth Wallen has been accused of distorting her racial background and, and then she took a DNA to prove her Native American heritage. However, she was heavily criticized of her reliance of DNA by Native American groups who believe such genetic test alone does not support or define the identity of Native American. James Watson is another famous figure who takes the primordial thinking and then he has famously publicly argued there's a genetic racial differences in human intelligence and he argued the white are a white race are superior in terms of the genetic based intelligence. So for those people who deeply embrace this approach, you know, especially like someone like Dr. Watson, racism and ethnic discrimination are often seen as a manifestation of our genetic nepotism. So they may view the racial and ethnic conflict as an inevitable outcome of the human race, you know, human society. So in other words, primordialists would argue that diversity is indeed the source of intergroup conflict and instability. And that's why they might use this way of thinking to argue anti-immigrant immigration policies and then argue the more homogeneity will bring the stability and the security to our society. But in today's social science, primordialism is no longer uh, commonly practiced and not popular at all. But instead, many scholars nowadays define race and ethnicity as a socially constructed category. But what does it really mean when we say race and ethnicity are socially constructed category? Who construct them, for what and why, under what circumstance and how? Once they were constructed, what kind of impact do they have on our lives? Scholars actually do not have a consensus over these questions. So now I wanted to introduce a few different approaches in a sociology who attempt to address these questions. One of the very popular classical books on race and ethnicity in a sociology is Mary Walters' uh, Ethnic Option. And her book is based on the idea that race and ethnicity are socially constructed category. In her book, she argued race and ethnicity mean and work differently for the dominant and minority groups. The meaning and the function of race and ethnicity is largely depend on the way in which groups are valued culturally, politically, and socioeconomically in the society. These key individuals, I put them on the slide, are dominant American racial group vis-a-vis -vis Caucasian individuals who use minority racial ethnic traits for their own interests and pleasure. And however, according to the Mary Waters, race and ethnicity are not just a matter of the choice for minority groups, nor is it just a symbolic label that we carry. Race and ethnicity are actually a mandatory for minority groups in American society. To illustrate this point, let me talk a little bit about Susie Gilroy Phipps case. Susie Gilroy Phipps lived all her life as a white woman. But when she obtained her birth certificate in her 40s, she learned that she was classified by the state of Louisiana as a black due to her distant black ancestor, which she was not even aware of. Gilroy Phipps sued the state of Louisiana when she, her request to change her racial classification was denied, but only unsuccessfully. State of Louisiana upheld its one drop rule and denied and her request. One drop rule was a very pervasive pra legal practice in the United States which basically means that anyone with a discernible trace of African ancestry, one thirty-second of the black vote to be exact, 
are is going to be considered and treated and classified as a black. And if my correction is correct, I believe the state of Louisiana is the last state to upheld this one drop rule. And therefore, uh, Gilroy Phipps lost her case. And then in 1983, the state of Louisiana finally repealed its law on the racial classification, but this reform was not retroactively, retroactively applied. Therefore, Susie Heroy Phipps uh, remained legally black to this day. This case tell us two important points about race and ethnicity. First, as Mary Water argued, race is a mandatory for minority in America. It is not something you can pick and choose and enjoy for holidays. And once society assigns you one, you cannot escape from it. No matter what a minority individual appears physically and how they have lived in their life, it doesn't matter. They cannot erase or change the way in which society defines who they are. In other words, if you're a minority, you cannot exercise your own autonomous power to define and own a sense of who you are in the same way as a dominant racial ethnic group can. Second point this case tells us is the society used not only the visible physical traits, but invisible traits such as blood, right? To imagine the boundary between dominant group and the minority groups. In other words, race can be imagined and constructed among individuals who look alike on the surface, so long as the dominant oppressive group can manage to imagine the difference in those invisible non-existence physical trait, regardless of the science. This is not unique to the United States. We see the similar example elsewhere around the world I will show those examples later today's talk, especially from Japan. So based on this idea of social construction, race as social construction, so sort of just such as Michael Omi and Howard Winan developed the theory of racial formation. In this very popular theory, they argue that it takes a very gradual process for race and ethnicity to become, become embedded in our society. It is a very slow but steady historical social process, which involves the various institutions, government, media, education, and you know, a legal system and a medical system and so forth. In this process, race and ethnicity are given a concrete meaning and expression by the specific relationship between groups and a social, economic, and historical context. Once this formation takes off, race and ethnicity begin to have the real impact on our life, despite the fact that they were socially constructed category to begin with, without any real biological substance. So race and ethnicity in this process become part of our everyday life and a belief system. And it become a point of our reference to understand the meaning of our and other people's behavior, action, character, and even the skill set. And when it became a part of our identity, race and ethnicity began to explain the social reality around us. So put differently, race and ethnicity, although they are not a real natural biological category, the consequences of these categories are very much real. Therefore, they start feeling very natural to us. These, this theory was a groundbreaking in a sense that it allows us to understand the importance, significance of local socioeconomic and historical context and the local relationship between the groups to construct the race and ethnicity. Their theory help us to understand the meaning of race and ethnicity and how they are used in our society differ across time and space. In other words, meaning of race and ethnicity and how they are imagined and practiced in our society do change over time. And they vary from one society to another. So they are neither universal nor stable categories. Some sociologists took the theory of social construction even to whole another level, a much farther. Dr. Eduardo Bonilla-Silver 
Um, he was a former president of the American Sociological Association. Um, is someone that I deeply respect. He advocated a theory of racial structuralism, or should I say structural rate theory of race. Based on his rigorous study about American experience, he argued that what we have right now in America is a racism without a racist. We now have the society, and due to the racial formation, Michael Omi and Howard Weiner mentioned, due to that racial formation, we now have a society that is so racialized, the race began to exert the independent, autonomous effect on our life. Autonomous from other social categories such as gender, class, ethnicity, nationality, religion. In his view and argument, race is no longer just a social, socially constructed category, but it became real when it became a part of our identity. It is not just what they are, it is what, you know, who they are. So he goes so far as that we need a structural theory of race, racism, race, and in order to fight against the structure of the racial inequality and injustice, what we need is a structure of racial equity, such as affirmative action. I generally agree with Dr. Vanilla Silver's observation such as in America, race became a very salient category and it has been treated as a separate category from you know, uh, ethnicity and other categories. And I agree with him that that's how it's done in the United States. And I also see the quite few cases where race overlap with group identity in America. And it is also true that racism has been so institutionalized in America, so much so that it does generate the systematic racialized outcome, even if there is very little to no intention of racism. For example, COVID-19 pandemic is not racially motivated, motivated phenomenon. The virus is not racist. It's not biased you know, with, by racism. However, when this deadly virus hit to the society that is so racially institutionalized, it actually produced the very skewed along the racial lines outcome of the death rate. So as he put it eloquently, in America, race seems to have life of its own. Race seems to have a very salient impact you know, apart from other categories. These theory that I just introduced are very powerful and very useful to explain what's happening in the United States. However, when we try to apply theory like Dr. Bonilla Silver's structural theory of race to make sense of race and ethnic relations in other society, including in Japan, we find it rather limiting because they are specifically based on the US history and American experience. And I do see the popular, you know, ideologue and scholars, you know, casually import that kind of America-based concept and conceptualization of race to explain what's going on in other part of the world, and they often fell short. While I, dis I do not disagree with the Bonil uh, Dr. Bonilla Silver's analysis and observation of American society and then the other you know, American theorists and of race, I do find some of their theoretical approach of race and ethnicity rather US centric. In fact, many theory of race and ethnicity in sociology in general are based on either American or European society, therefore, by design, they are US and Eurocentric. For any theory to be useful to a scholars, it has to be able to explain the phenomenon in more than one society or one particular region. Therefore, and furthermore, what the limitation of these theory, especially this racial structuralism tell us is to extend race began to assert its independent and study and impact on somebody's life, 
and the life chance in American society speaks volumes about American history and American experience rather than race and ethnicity in general. In other words, as Michael Omi and Howard Weiner pointed out in their theory, geopolitical and local conditions and the social relationship embedded in the local context greatly matter for the way in which race and ethnicity are imagined, constructed, and practiced in our society. This realization brings me to the last theoretical approach that I wanted to introduce today. It is the boundary or relational approach. I found this particular theoretical approach more useful and applicable than racial structuralism because it is far um, more feasible to apply to explain other society besides the United States. In this approach, race and ethnicity are considered categories rather than group. Unlike primordialism, this approach does not see race and ethnicity as some kind of a container that have, you know, consists of the stable distinguishable traits. In this approach, categories such as race and ethnicity are used as a tool for the purpose of social closure. What is a social closure? Social closure is omnipresent everyday practice of the boundary drawing in order to allocate resources, which usually are limited and scarce among the different groups. According to this approach, no group can exist without interacting with another group. In other words, group do not emerge or exist in the total isolation. In order for group to exist and maintain its existence, it requires interaction with another group. Boundary construction assumes there is more than one group. So when two groups encounter and began to interact together, we can generally expect two possible consequences to follow. First, when group encountered and mutually agreed to share and exchange the resources collaboratively, the boundary between these two groups may be retained at the first, but then eventually eradicate as these two groups interact more frequently and intimately. However, when the one group decided to conquer another group upon encounter in order to monopolize those scarce resources to all to themselves, then the differences between two groups are exaggerated, specified, and reified. And those differences become a part of their identity as it happened in a racial formation. One can argue what historically happened in the United States is a perfect case of this second consequence, a boundary specification. Whenever white encountered another group, they tried to monopolize the resources. And then to do that, they specify the dif imagine difference between themselves and the others, and they utilize race and ethnicity to justify that differences to marginalize and overpower and dominate on other groups. So much so that in the United States, category ended up becoming a group as the Dr. Bonilla Silva observed. So based on this theory of the boundary making and relational approach, what is required for the boundary to emerge and persist in our society is not, you know, the stable essence of the, you know, or similarity among the group, but instead it required the subject of others, another group that they can define as different from themselves. So the group who need to establish, and also the group need to establish the set of the rules and the standard to define who those others are and how to treat them. And the race and ethnicity happen to be a tool to do just that. Power matters greatly in this process. A group with more power and access to resources can monopolize the process of the defining and maintaining the group boundaries. This is the reason why whites in America could make their own racial classification optional for themselves 
but mandatory for the minority group. Let me show you a few examples of how boundary specification manifested in our society. Today, Nazism and the Holocaust are almost the synonyms of the atrocious racism in our humanity. And Nazi Germany, racism was not a colonism in a sense that it didn't rely on the visible physical differences. So physical differences between Jews and non-Jews are so obscure that they needed to rely on the identity signifier, such as a Jewish badge to identify Jews. And as I show in a previous slide, I did, you know, race and ethnicity function as an identity signifier to draw the boundary between groups. And this kind of identity signifier can be found in the colonial Japan as well. In the colonial Japan, Japan, Japanese modern state has had a face the dilemma. Externally, they so wanted to uh, define themselves, you know, uh, wanted to legitimize their ownership of the colonies. And they did not want to have the Western empires to interfere and they question their legitimacy as an imperial state to own their own colonies. But so they use the Western notion of the race to claim well, Koreans and Taiwanese are part of, you know, the same Asian race, and therefore I, we were establishing Pan-Asian empires that is distinguished, distinguished from the Western empires. But internally, they really wanted to exploit their colonized population. They didn't believe they were the same racial groups, and rather they wanted to demarcate the subtle difference, you know, boundaries between colonized and colonizers. They, you know, as in the course of the colonialism, Japan did force the Koreans to assimilate it into the culture, but they were mindful that if they do, because of the largely absence, physical, visible difference between Koreans and Japanese, they have to have a, some discrete I, internal identity signifier to continue to maintain the boundary between Japanese and Koreans. They rely on the Koseki family registry system to do that. And then I'm showing the picture of the Korean Koseki system. And here you can see that when the Japanese government, colonial state, forced the Korean to adapt the Japanese sounding name, but in the Koseki, they also make sure to list the Korean name so that they could continue to distinguish Koreans and Japanese, even after they changed their you know, name, the most powerful identifications. Boundary approach is particularly useful for us to understand and explain how race and ethnicity have been used to establish the boundary of Japanese as a race, ethnicity, and a nation. While the feudal Japan had its own unique understanding of the race, it was quite different from the Western notion of the race, which is based on the very pseudo-scientific ideas. As modern Japan, you know, uh, interact more directly with the Western world, they began to be exposed to the Western notion of race. And they, they also imported this concept you know, uh, of the race from the West and elaborated in a way that it made sense and it was able to apply it locally. And anthropologists in particular played a very important role in introducing a Western notion of the race and ethnicity and in localizing such to fit the situation in Japan. Policymakers and intellectual in a major Japan started using a concept of race and ethnicity interchangeably. They deliberately did not um, make distinction between the concept of race and ethnicity. This flexible and overlapping usage of race and ethnicity was really intentional. It allowed Japan to establish the boundary between themselves and other group who are similar to them in terms of the cultural physical traits. And this overlapping usage of race and ethnicity can be seen in other cases outside of Japan where the visible differences are not readily available between dominant and subordinate group as well. Both, uh, both Ainu and Ryukyu are among the earliest colony of Japan, and they had a long history of interaction with, uh, interaction with Wajin, the mainland Japanese, 
that it was a peaceful at first, and then they gradually become very hostile later. Although those two groups are forced to assimilate it into Japanese culture, Wajin culture, but they remain racialized. They continue to be differentiated and discriminated as different racial origin, ethnic origin minority. This is not very well known today, even among Japanese people, but black women who are believed to be the descendant of the social outcast group from the ancient feudal time caste system are also once considered to have a different racial origin from other Japanese people. Anthropologists you know, in the Meiji Japan have written extensively to allege this, their theory of different racial origin of black men. These early modern discourse of racial origin of Japanese and other minority groups in Japan share the one goal, that is to specify the boundary of the Japanese empire and prove themselves and the rest of the world the Japanese are superior that could and should have brought the fate of being colonized by other Western powers. In other words, Japanese imperialists were trying to reconcile this competing dilemma their inferiority complex against the you know, European and America, a Western empires, um, but on the on one hand, and then, but their sense of superiority, you know, superiority obsession against the colonized population within the boundary of its empire. By racializing its minority groups on its soil, Japanese state and intellectual attempt to cement their own superior status in Asia. One of the notorious examples of their attempt and ongoing effort to do that was the House of Men at the Osaka Expo in 1903. Japan hosted an international expo in Osaka that year in order to show off to the world how advanced and civilized Japanese are as compared to the other colonized population that they conquered. So outside of this expo, there was a private pavilion called House of Men, and in which they displayed the real human being from different group, minority groups, include Ryukyu, Ainu, Korean, Taiwanese, and displayed this real human being as civilized human race. So they were also through this kind of display of their ostensible racial superiority sentiment against this group, they were also trying to convince their own people in the society, Japanese are superior to those people they just you know, encountered and occupied. During the colonial period, <clears throat> Japanese state continued to use the concept of race interchangeably define you know, their positionality outside of the empire. And this is yet another example of racializing others. Korean certain, Koreans certainly did not ex, um, escape from racialization by the Japanese state. And this archive is showing that uh, this is a police instructional material to show how to identify Koreans from Japanese, right? And then they have a really long list of, you know, how Korean look different from the average Japanese. And this type of the racialization continue at the quotidian level in Japan today. If you Google how to tell who, it, who Korean is, you will see a very rich variety of elaborated method to detect the fake Japanese in Japanese society, fake Japanese, AKA Koreans. And one of my favorite theory is the Korean have a thin ear ropes and I never knew, you know, uh, the, they imagined our Europe look different from Japanese. In the context of a colonial Japan, averting the clear demarcation between race and ethnicity, you know, as a categories, made more sense politically. They were able to, you know, assert that um, intricate dilemma, uh, resolve, resolve the intricate dilemma they had as empire and an imperial colonialist against the people who look alike. However, after the defeat in the World War II, political context and the relationship between nation state changed dramatically. In this new political context, post-war Japanese intellectual abandoned the idea of Pan-Asianism, 
or assertion that Jap Japanese are most evolved to race and ethnic ethnicity among Asian groups. They began to advocate monoracial ethnic origin of Japanese-ness. And then they began to nurture this myth of Japanese homogeneity and then sort of excuse themselves or oh, the reason why the Japanese imperial endeavor failed is because it was based on a misguided notion that we can establish we were part of the hybrid you know, race. And then so they began to embrace this like 180 degree different you know, definition of Japanese national, racial and ethnic origins. And they began to distinguish the concept of race and ethnicity more. This pen, uh, literature penetrated into the various corner of the Japanese society and is often used to justify the exclusion against the non-Japanese group, particularly remaining colonial immigrants from Taiwan and Korea in the post-war Japanese society. For contemporary Japan, you do not have any shortage of the stock example of how the prominent politician refer to the homogeneous, you know, ethnic and racial origin of Japan to assert the uniqueness and a superiority or stability of Japanese society. And for the contemporary Japan, making distinction between race and ethnicity serve their renewed political interest in a globalized world. They can assert that Japan is devoid of racial issues and racism in facing a criticism from the international society against their mistreatment of their own minority groups. And they can also justify their exclusive immigration policies on the ground that, well, Japanese culture is so unique because of this homogenous origin that not everybody can get used to or assimilated easily to our culture. Today, Japanese government takes the position Japan cannot have the racism because minority groups such as Aino, Okinawan, Black, Korean, Korean, Taiwanese are the same racial groups as Asian, right? This position masks the history of the past racial formation and its continuing legacy on today's you know, experience of the minority groups. And then also perpetuate the notion of a monoracial ethnic nation in Japan. Furthermore, the myth of homogeneity makes it difficult for minority groups to define their group identity and fight against the discrimination. So let me wrap up my webinar. We started this webinar with several questions, and I hope that what I have discussed so far uh, could help us to address some of those questions. And I do believe the race and ethnicity are definitely not a natural real category. I don't care what the ancestor.com said and your DNA test said. They are not based on any stable distinguishable traits such as DNA. If they are, they should be universal, unchanged, but they don't. Whether or not race and ethnicity are different, right, as a concept, really depends on a particular historical and social political context. In the case of Japan, in the pre-war period, they were they meant the same thing and they were used interchangeably, but that's not the case in the post-war period. In the post-war period, the salient difference between race and ethnicity became more important as the political interest of dominant group changes. And I also don't believe the diversity such as racial and ethnic differences is a root cause of the intergroup conflict or instability. Instead, it is the political and economic motives and the interest of the dominant group who hijack these different differences to conquer and dominate another group in order to monopolize the scarce resources are the, indeed the root cause of the social instability and a group conflict. However, it is important to note one more point before I finish. That is categories do create the groups. So far I discussed, and then many theorists and scholars often focus on how group, dominant group created categories to suppress the other groups. But what we also need to pay attention is that minority groups sometimes use the category the dominant group created to discriminate against them to fight back that very oppression. 
So there is a paradox here. In order to fight against the categorical racial ethnic injustice and inequality, subordinate group needs the category to unify their identity and if, uh, uh, fighting front to um, effectively fight against that uh, discrimination in Japan, uh, in the society, I'm sorry. So this is an interesting paradoxical idea that you need a category to fight back the oppressions. And so those people who were born and raised in Japan or part of Asia, like I did, you probably did not think you are Asian. I certainly didn't call myself, I identify myself as an Asian when I was in Asia. It was only after I come to the United States, I'm seen and called and classified and asked to write my racial background as Asian, only then, you know, this became a part of our identity. So categories such as the Asian Americans and AAPI are the category that was imposed upon very diverse group of population who migrated from Asia by the dominant group in the United States. But you know, the Asian Americans, AAPI community utilized that homogenizing category to unite their diverse population to collectively fight back the racism against them. And in Zionist Korean did the same thing. Zionist Korean is not a category of their own choice, but they utilize that to overcome internal faction to fight back. So as much as we, want, we wanted to get rid of these categories that are fake and not real and scientific, and they use to discriminate us in a minority groups, but at the same time, minority also rely on this category to fight back that very oppression based on those categories. So let me have my final words. In order to, for us to better understand the issue of race and ethnicity, we should not prioritize a definition of a category that developed based on one society or one vision or histories and experience and apply with assumption that that kind of theory can explain other societies' experiences. Our understanding of race and ethnicity are based on US and Eurocentric perspective, and that, that needs to be challenged and re-examined, especially when we try to understand what's going on in Japan. Not doing that could have a negative consequences to those minority groups, as I discussed in this webinar. As we have seen in a relational approach, it is feasible to develop decentered theoretical approach and a move away from the colonial ideology and a legacy embedded in our scholarly literature today. And doing that will help us better understand race and ethnicity, not only in the United States and Japan, but also the world too. So thank you so much uh, for listening to it. And I would love to take uh, feedback and questions. Uh, thank you so much for such a rich talk, Professor Shin. Um, I am amazed how you managed to take us through several centuries of history in less than 50 minutes. Um, and we're so glad that you accepted the invitation to collaborate on this project. Um, a big thank you to those of you in the audience as well for attending and for sending in your questions. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, my name is Rachel Willis and I am a collaborator on the JSET project along with Sophie, who you met earlier, um, Harrison Watson and Professor Reginald Jackson. Um, I wanna move us into the Q&A portion of the webinar now. So for those of you who may have joined late, you'll notice that there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you would like to think for a minute and then pose your questions to Professor Shin, you can do so there. And I'm going to try to get through as many of your questions as possible. Um, so to start off, Professor Shin, we will begin with a question from um, Ayaka Yoshimizu, who says, thank you very much for your informative and rich lecture. I'm curious to hear some concrete examples where you felt the theory of racial structuralism was limited in explaining racism in Japan. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm sorry. I just, the sound was in and off. Can you, Rachel, sorry. Can you repeat that? Oh yeah, no problem. Um, so they're asking um, for some examples um, where you felt that the theory of racial structuralism mm -hmm. was limited in explaining racism in Japan. Well, so I, I think I was going a little bit too quickly to contextualize that in, a, in my teaching in the race and ethnic relations, I usually go dive into it, spend actually multiple days to explain and how that's the case. Um, for example, the Bonilla so uh, the Dr. Bonilla Silver really believe that it is important to um, separate the race from other category, including ethnicity, right? And then because based on the United States history, race was always prioritized in a very separate category. And then, but not doing that sometimes give away the critics against the, you know, uh, racial, in, racial injustice advocate, like the fighters and to say that, hey, if the black Obama can be a president of the United States, we are post racial group, right? And then that kind of rhetoric inhibit and, you know, for the, those scholars and activists who wanted to have the society and to be accountable for their own racial bias and the discrimination and the consequence of that in the society. And then so I can understand the motivation behind the structural uh, theory of the race that to understand that race actually is can be an independent category from the ethnicity and class and to really talk about the very specific problem that associated with the race, right? But not every society actually treat the race as a such a salient category. And then that's also can be found in Latin America as well. The that way that the race is defined in Japan is a very marky, right? And then when they say the Koreans and Japanese are different ethnic group, and then they have also different physical traits. Right, so they were using the race and ethnicity interchangeably, right, to mean the various different things. So the way in which race is being, you know, imagined and practiced in America is quite different from that in Japan, and in some cases in the society, depending on some local context, race and ethnicity, but according to the dominant group, wanted to be marky and overlapping rather than separate categories. And that design is intentional. So that's the example that I was trying to explain very quickly in this webinar. And I'm happy to give the references, you know, how that's the case, not only in the United States, but in other part of the world as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have a question from Winnie Ni nee who asks, um, well, she says, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I am fascinated by the idea of self-affirmation action and how do we incorporate that in teaching? Self-affirmation action. I'm not sure what she means by self-affirmation action. Um, action. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm blanking. Oh, right. I, I think she was interpreting. Um, can I ask Winnie to elaborate what she means by that? And then can I come back to this questions? Yes. So. Okay. When you, oh, Sorry, when okay, you so she, she, the first thing is added, um, when you mentioned racial equity, uh -huh. um, racial Winnie, equity. I'm gonna have to ask you to elaborate a little bit. A little bit more, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry for, so, but we'll, we'll put your question on hold and we'll come okay. back to it. Um, so let me see, there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, so, we have a question from Chevelle Jones. Um, yeah, I, re I read that question. So her question is uh, the boundary and relation approach. And yeah. this is her first time to hurt this approach and what is the origin of the theory. So I don't know if that is the origin, but the one of the most popular book often being utilized to elaborate this approach was the Frederick Berth, European uh, scholar anthropologist who wrote the boundary uh, the group, boundary of the group, I can't remember the name of it, but his name is Frederick Berth. And his student, Richard Jenkins, elaborated his theory in a contemporary, it was many decades ago. And then, and then I think their theory got revived by uh, renowned sociologists like Roger Spoolbaker and UCLA and his student, Malalavlan, 
you know, uh, at the professor at the UC Berkeley have applied that ideas um, to theorize the race and ethnicity. And in ASA, I think it was about 10 years ago, there was a very interesting back and forth correspondence between Dr. Bonilla Silver and a Dr. Uh, um, Lamens about this very idea that I discussed. So I would really suggest to look at those references to learn more about boundary approach, you know, advocated first by the uh, Frederick, some scholar like Frederick Berth and Richard Jenkins, and then elaborated by the uh, Dr. Roger Brubakers and Dr. Nala Loveman. Thank you for that. Um, uh, we have a question from Jessica Harada who asks, um, and I, I apologize, I don't speak Japanese actually. So if I, so, if I yes. these and words, the sorry. difference between Minzoku and Jinshu, how yes. are they were interchangeably during the pre-war period? And I'm afraid this is going to be a really long, so can I just say that I strongly recommend to take a look at the book. And there is so many anthropologists, historians, and then various uh, intellectual got into the discourse of the defining race and ethnicity. And then Asia Oguma written the book about, you know, myth of the Japanese homogeneity, the boundary of Japanese, and both books are translated into the English. And I recommend to read those books to really understand and dive yourself into how rich, you know, um, uh, the uh, discussion about over the Minzoku and then Jinshu are discussed. And in my reading of those, you know, uh, early discourse among the intellectuals, the Jinshu and the Minzoku could mean, uh, you know, same thing, might as well be the same thing. Um, you know, they were referring to the same thing. And then there are some, some scholar trying to distinguish, you know, those are two different things. But eventually, by the time that rhetoric of being utilized by the state to make a policy, they were sort of interchangeably. But I have to say that I am kind of generalizing it to fit to this talk. If you slice the different discourse at the different given period time, you might see there's some idea of uh, the idea of trying to separate these Jinshu and Minzoku, the race and ethnicity become popular. And then it was overpowered by the people who say that they should, they don't have to be that different, right? So, but overall, if I have to just give the general sense of what's going on between the pre-war and the post-war, the salient difference between uh, race and ethnicity become stronger a lot more in the post-war period than in a pre-war period because the dominant group, the political interest to do so became more, uh, uh, become stronger in the post-war period. As, as they, the, you know, the international context changed to the imperial colonial period to the Cold War period. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question related to teaching um, yes. from Allison Alexi who asks, um, do you have anything you could share for those of us who are thinking about how to respond specifically to anti-AAPI violence in the US context? And, uh, to understand the theory are these categories are social constructed really, but at the same time, uh, it's a double-edged sword. It is a category to oppress us, but it, it is also a category to unite us and solidify us to transcend. And I think fighting against the anti, you know, the fighting the racism and then discrimination based on the categories, social construct category is a long process that involves the various stage. And I do believe one of that stage to recognize and then turn the table and they use this category that created by the dominant group, but in a way that meets our demand as an oppressed group. So the category does not have to be the one that oppressed us. Category can be the one that unite us to have my vo our voice hard. But I think as a social scientist and teacher in a class that teach often about the race and ethnicity, I want our student to understand how that stage are involved in that process. And I don't want people to take that category for granted to think we are all Asians. 
and then ignore the differences behind that label. Acknowledge that we are diverse behind that label, but we are conscientiously using that label to fight back the oppression and then construct a more diverse society. So I think that will be the message that I use in my teaching. Thank you. Um, I guess kind of going off of that, um, I'll take a question from Mason who asks, um, well, they say, thank you so much for your lecture, Dr. Shin. Um, my question is about when groups interact with each other under the boundary slash relational approach. You mentioned that there are two paths that will happen. One, groups mutually agree to share. Two, one group decides to conquer the other. Um, and my question is, do you know of any examples where this dynamic shifted? Maybe groups decided to share and then one group decided to conquer. Do you know of any examples of this in Japanese history? I knew a new group. <laughs> and you know, those are the two examples. I mean, I guess every other Koreans as well. Um, you know, there was we often think of the history in the past few centuries, but if we really think back, I guess that's sort of the part of the legacy of the U. US centrism because American history is only a few hundred years, whereas in another part of the world, it's like a century, you know, the thousands of years. And I mean, Japan would not have, uh, you know, rice farming if it wasn't the interaction with the, you know, uh, people in the Korean Peninsula to learn how to farm that uh, rice. So, you know, there were so many examples of the interaction in the ancient time in a history that where the group learn from one another and they share the skills and resources. And then the resources can be a knowledge, right? How to farm and how to hunt, how to trade materials with Ainu. And then through that peaceful, um, you know, uh, non-oppressive, uh, the trading, you know, that each other's culture has, um, Advanced. I don't mean to say these things to be idealistic. We can live in a harmonious way. I think capitalism or basically <laughs> um, uh, deleted that chance of doing that. Um, so that I, I feel less optimistic on as long as we live under the system of the capitalism, how the you know group with the different resources can live, you know, peacefully. But before the capitalism. And, and you know, group interaction does not always have to be colonialistic and oppressive. And then I think the diversity, in fact, is the reason why humanity survived despite, despite the different, you know, uh, various challenges of natural disaster and, you know, epidemic and a pandemic. And in fact, the gene if there's anything about the mo monocular biology tells us is the diversification of the gene pool you know, makes us stronger and then more hardy, you know, as a human race against the various disease, right? So I think the diversity in that sense has been the foundation of human civilization at advancement. And it was probably after idea of the capitalism and colonialism are in, introduced, you know, the race and ethnicity become the tools, you know, negative tool to conquer one another. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm trying to. I know it's just. I'm a little bit frazzled. <laughs> um, I did want to go back. Uh, I uh, think I shortened a question uh, by accident. Um, this was Alison Alexi's question. Um, so the beginning said, um, "Thank you for this spectacular presentation. Your ideas are so inspiring." And thinking about how academics and scholars should understand our responsibilities in using or teaching around racial categories. Um, on the one hand, I'm thinking about how I might add Asian American examples to my courses in the fall term. On the other hand, might that further reify the category? So I don't know if you want to comment yeah. on that. So. And then I think that's why we need to step back and talk about how these category came into being, right? And then um, whenever I teach about uh, for example, when I teach race and ethnicity in an introductory to sociology class or advanced, you know, undergraduate courses on race and ethnicity, I actually unpack what the Asian American means, right? And then um, so by taking, you know, take the comparison 
And if you take a mean, I mean, I'm sorry to be a little bit quant, like I, I'm a sociologist and I do work with the quantitative data, that if you look at the mean of the income of the Asian American, it's actually much higher than any other you know, racial groups in the United States. But if I break that down by the national origin, years of the United, you know, like the stay in the United States and a language fluency, all those variables that is available in a public data domain, right? You began to see the huge, you know, differences and then generational, you know, uh, accumulated wealth is also important to really understand the experience of the, um, you know, uh, immigrants as well. And I remember in a master thesis, I wrote about, you know, why the Korean American have such a higher, you know, mean income as compared to the, all the other Asian group. Well, it turns out it's not because they are wealthy and loaded. The Korean women have a higher rate of labor participation by uh, entrepreneur, right? And in such a small business, such as like a nail salon and laundromat and so forth, right? So, so, and then I take, I look at the data and I also put that in a historical context. So does that mean that they have more saving in the bank? Does that make them a model minority? And then, you know, um, and then they were more successful? Not necessarily. Their wealth is much more fragile than the wealth that white counterpart, you know, Caucasian people dominate. Because there have been in the United such a, short period of a time that they didn't have a chance to diversify the wealth. You know, they might have the, you know, the net amount of the resources that they have might be higher on the number. When, when the 2008 recession happened, when I look at the, how the wealth shifted after the recession, right? The Asian actually have lost most of the wealth due to the recession. I'm very curious to see how this, you know, pandemic recession hit to those groups. And you know, this whole rhetoric with Asian American, all of them are minority groups, right? And then if we use the Asian American label, we are also reifying the whole group and homogenizing it and projecting the stereotypes and reproducing that. So in my class, in my teaching, I refer to those important contextual differences that a group experience. And then that extra labor is absolutely important not to reproduce the ratified categories in our teaching to understand that. And especially in the context of Japanese studies or Asian study, you know, to talk about that. And then to that extent, I do rely on a quantitative data to objectively explain how that experience manifests. But I'm sure the narrative account of that is also a powerful uh, pedagogical tool in our classroom as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, we have a question from Grace Tang, who asks, um, she says, thank you for this presentation. Can you talk about approaches and theories to simultaneously grasping how one, um, the ethnic racial majority is oppressive towards minorities and to how white privilege and white supremacy still has powerful effects in East Asia? Um, I am a Japanese studies scholar teaching in Hong Kong and was surprised um, that my local um, HK slash mainland Chinese students struggle a lot to acknowledge that this is a reality. They seem to find it hugely confusing to grapple with, even if they recognize it to some extent. In Hong Kong, it would be Han Chinese privilege slash whiteness. With my experience as a Taiwanese American, having spent substantial time in Japan, this became a type of common sense to me, but is a problem that isn't sufficiently addressed in Hong Kong and China and the Sinophone context. So do I need to repeat anything? No, I'm reading it. Uh, so I hear you okay. <laughs> to try to, it's a very complex question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can get it right. Last thing is that, um, can, can I talk about the approach and theory to simultaneous class? I think the Asian majority is oppressive by a minority and white privilege powerful effect in Asia. I don't know to these two are addressed simultaneously, but I know these two questions intersect with one another. Um, so let me address the second part of this, white privilege supremacist has a powerful effect in East Asia. I'm not sure what this 
you know, grace means by this. So let me answer this first based on how I interpreted your question. If I'm wrong, please elaborate your question again for me. And I apologize if I get it wrong. Um, you know, the Japanese people have definitely learned, like a Japanese state and ideologue and intellectual did learn how to use race to oppress the other groups from the Western powers, right? Because they send the envoys to the Western world, understood the eugenics behind the racial classification and discrimination. And then they, there was a no other choice but utilize that to the extent to exert their own superiority. But at the same time, they had this dilemma, right? So they wanted to be closely associated with the white race to exert the, their own racial superiority. But at the same time, they know they look much closer to the people who are trying to dominate Chinese and you know Taiwanese and Koreans. So in that, you know, in a manner the Japanese discriminate against a minority group, I do see the, you know, like undeniable power between the way the white supremacists discriminate against their, you know, minority groups. So, and then, um, and then, I mean, I, this is very casual, like example, and I'm just throwing it out there, but I don't have any expert knowledge. But I'm often struck by the how the Japanese comics and animation depict the Japanese. There was a um, depict the Japanese as a very like uh, um, Anglo Caucasian looking, and then there was a comics the very controversial comic anti Korean you know comics right, and then the Japanese kid who is very innocent in this comics. Uh, learning like encounter the very hostile Koreans who hate Japanese and then the way that in this comic this book is whole theme was let's teach our young kids the real history from the Japanese point of view not from the colonized you know Korean people's point of view the Japan is not oppressor Japan did a great thing in the Korea and we modern help them modernize their country that kind of thing I didn't read the whole book I have to be honest it was so offensive that I just have to put down afterwards but one thing I took away from that comic is that why the Korean has all the slants eyes and not Japanese, right? And Japanese character look very much like white, Caucasian looking, as it, you see in uh, any Japanese animation and comics. But when they portray the Koreans and Chinese, they portrayed in a very stereotypical, offensive racial cartoon. I found it in the United States, right? So in a way, in this popular culture, I do see the reproduction of white supremacist, you know, tainted Japanese, you know, expression of their own sense of racialized superiority against other Asian groups. And then I would highly recommend to get that comic book and show it to the students. And then do you see the power on the reproduction of that sentiment, you know, in that unconsciously uh, done that by those people. Who advocate that point of view? Hey, thank you. Um, no, I actually have a question I wanted I, I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you. Um, just coming from a Black Studies background, um, I appreciated your references to Omi and Wanat, for example, in their theory of racial formation. Um, and I just wanted to get your perspective on what you think Black Studies can offer to Japanese studies, and maybe vice versa as well. If you would like to comment on that. Uh, Okay, sorry. I just I I I'm sorry. My sound is that sound is on and off. I don't know why. No, it's okay. Can it's you okay. Repeat that question. Yeah. Um. So, um. What do you see as um kind of what Black studies can offer to Japanese studies and vice versa? Uh, vice versa. Oh geez, I learned so much from the Jap Black studies. I mean, I first came to this country thinking that I was gonna learn a lot about, you know, how the African Americans. Um, conceptualize the race and ethnicity and, you know, fight in the civil rights movement and continue to grapple the oppression that and the legacy of the slavery and all of that. To me, it was intuitively resonated with uh, that oppressions. And if, first of all, the Black, the whole literature of the, among, you know, about the African-American experience, African diaspora experiences, gave us a vocabulary that we needed. I mean, it certainly gave me the set of the vocabularies that I needed to really 
understand and explain what I have experienced as oppressed minority groups in Japan. And I remember when I was growing up in Japan, I was racialized, right? And then it's not just the ethnicity that it matters because ethnically, I am more closer to Japanese. I speak the Japanese language. I, I cook Japanese food very well. You know, so if, the, if we go by the ASA's definition of ethnicity, then I'm actually close to the Japanese. And I, sometimes I speak Japanese language better than some of the Japanese people, right? Because of my educational background. And physically, I can pass as Japanese if I don't say my name or flush my South Korean passport. So in what way am I different from all of you, right? In Japanese, but I was being racialized. I was told by my friends that I smell bad because it must be my Korean like DNA or your cheekbone is so high. And I was like, the girl who said that has a really high cheekbone <laughs> that I do too. So I was really subjected to those racial and ethnic, you know, you know, classification and a subjectiveness. And I didn't have the vocabulary because in Japan, there was supposed to be no race and ethnically, we were very similar. Then how am I supposed to explain? And then people call it discrimination, yeah. But that sounds like a gender discrimination. There's something about my experience as a minority is very scary and resonate deeply with um, you know, African-American experience. And I remember when I was in uh, middle school, my English teacher uh, made us listen to the Martin Luther King speech, famous speech, I have a dream. I sob, like we were given the translation, Japanese translation of his speech. I sob, that was my genuine reaction to his speech because I felt like he was explaining my experience and my existence, right? and the hope that I needed to have as a minority. And I knew that moment, I got to study about the you know, African-American experience of the rights movement. And that was the biggest intention that I had when I first came to the United States. So why can't black study um, influence so much? <laughs> like, I feel like I owe so much to the black scholar and the black studies and the theories and all of that. But then I hit the moment when I tried to literally apply the Black experience to explain what's going on in Japan, there was a limitation that I had described. And then I feel like as the, you know, I want the race ethnic studies at the in the, you know, utilize experience in, in Japan, and then could give up some different fresh perspective for the black scholars to understand their own experience and to show that actually their experience is very unique in that, in a sense that they were, they were very much demarcated differently, you know, by that historical context and the colonialism and, and capitalism and then and then you know the 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 eugenics ideas and so forth. So that in that sense, the context in which that they were oppressed and fought back greatly matters to their experience. And hopefully that insight helped the you know, African-American studies scholar to understand their own experience as well. Sorry, I took up too much time, but that was a no, kind that of was... hit the code. <laughs> yeah, no, for thank me. you for sharing such uh, personal experiences and you certainly don't have to. And um, yeah, I agree. I, I have learned, um, I've been on this project for a year and I've, I've learned a lot from just um, kind of delving into Japanese studies and it's pushed me to think past kind of like the US context or more broadly like a Western hemisphere kind of context. So I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I have a question from um, Reginald Jackson who is asking, um, could you uh, discuss or contextualize the more recent Japanese right-wing affinity with American white supremacist rhetoric, i.e. Trumpism Mm -hmm. um, and how should we understand this style of affinity in racial terms? Yeah, I mean, sometimes when I see that, I feel like if history can repeat itself, doesn't it? And what happens in the beginning of the modernization is happening too. And uh, so that's a very important question. And then I'm certainly uh, 
scared sometimes when I listen to the, you know, Japanese popular TV shows on YouTube and so forth and how they actually embrace the Trumpism because in a way, Again, I think I'm going to have to look at this question in a context of the geopolitical, con you know, politics, right? Japan is both Japan and the United States. I mean, no hegemonic country stayed as a hegemonic power in the world society forever. You know, the Britain was one of the hege hegemonic empire, and then they have to step down and give that new position to the United States. And Japan had its own economic success in the 80s and 90s and enjoyed that world top status of economy. Now it's overpowered, it's shadowed by the emerging economies in China and India, right? So in that sense, I can understand why the people, uh, the, you know, some of the political readers and people in Japan and the United States felt threatened, right? By the force of the globalization and changing dynamics and geopolitics. And then somehow, um, found affinity between them and they to find a similar challenges and shared destiny, you know, as a declining, uh, 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 you know, um, economies and, you know, world power and it's still trying to retain its own relevance in a world society. And then it, oftentimes in those contexts, uh, the, this very exaggerated supremacist ideologue tend to become popularized among the people. When people are scared, they tend to not pay attention to the rational logic or scientific data, but they often more re emotional response to the ideologue and it, it, the ideological rhetoric. And I think I do see the parallel, con you know, parallel similarities, not similarity, but the parallels you know, of the variables uh, um, that both Japan and the United States are facing and then how they might want to rely on that rhetoric to uh, feel secure in their own identity. And it's a very problematic, and I don't think it's accidental. And then some actors do make a conscious effort to unite and then link with one another, you know, and that this day and age with digital technology, it's far more easier to connect with the people beyond the borders, right? So that allows them to, you know, seek each other and amplified by voice. And that is very, very troubling. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more, maybe two questions. Um, so I will start with um, a question from Sune Kawakita, who asks, um, they say, fascinating presentation. What is your take on Zainichi and Japan um, that has divided politically between pro-North Korean and pro-South Korea um, and has injustice towards them in Japan united them on some fronts? Um, the division is still there and it has been always there in the post-war period. And then it, it's kind of, you know, I'm just writing a chapter where I'm explaining in my book, in my manuscript, how that happened. And it's such an unfortunate, you know, the sentiment that these struggling Koreans experience in the post-war, because when these Koreans in Japan came to Japan, the country was united. It was one country, it was colonized. And then when they were finally liberated from the Japanese colonial rule, before they had a chance to go back, country got divided. And then they didn't really choose in a sense that they, did, they couldn't really make the info, informed decision you know, South Korea basically ordered, you know, American authority who was occupying Japan, you know, when you register Korean, the Koreans lost the Japanese imperial citizenship after the war. So they are overnight classified as foreigners and alien without any set of legal rights. And they became stateless. And stateless in the era of the nation state is a horrible place to be in because there's no country. You, your rights are based on the nation for the national belonging. So when they became stateless, they didn't have anything to hold on to. And then the just two divided countries, right? North and South Korean regime, instead of helping them, they'd basically recruit them to support their you know, regime. And that's how they ended up acquiring a different you know, regency to South and North Korea, right? And they were in a way being used by, these, by, by the various states to their own advantage and disregarded their interest, right? 
But in the 70s and 80s, the, as the more second and third generation Koreans are born, including myself, I'm a third generation Chinese Korean, we see Japan as our home, you know, even though Japan might not see, you know, us as part of them. We are very much part of their society. We are part of their history. So those Chinese activists and second and third generation overcame those differences between North and South and then said, demand the right. We, not, we have a right to belong and live in Japan as an equal human being to all of you, right? So there is a definitely a effort to overcome and that united front effort, you know, anchored in the language of the human rights is the very reason why there was a series of legal reform that apart from the suffrage, Chinese Korean had the one of the most stable immigration status. We won't get deported you know, unlike other immigrants. And we have rights to the social securities and national pensions and, you know, medical, you know, uh, all of that, that long-term resident alien can enjoy was mm -hmm. a direct fruits of those Chinese Korean United, you know, civil rights movement that they had in that from seventies and eighties. So. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately. Um, so I'm gonna have to uh, go ahead and stop us there with the Q and A. Um, but once again, it has been an honor to learn from you, Professor Shin. Um, and I want you, I want to uh, thank you for getting our series off to such a great start. Um, I do want to revisit a couple of announcements that Sophie made at the beginning, um, namely that we have a graduate workshop coming up in June. Um, the application for that will go live tomorrow at noon, and it is open to graduate students as well as advanced undergraduate students um, who want to work with faculty members uh, to develop uh, anti-racist syllabi. Um, and the link to the application on our website should be in the chat. Um, I also want to announce again that our next speaker will be Dr. Uh, Takashi Fujitani. He will be giving a talk the same time next Thursday and you can also find the registration link for that in the chat. So thank you everyone and please enjoy your afternoons. Yep. Thank you. And then feel free to email me with a question that I couldn't answer fully. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for hosting.